I think the way, sorry, the way we're going to do this is uh, Sherry's going to get us started substantively, but I wanted to give a brief uh, sort of uh, introduction. We've got a second microphone over here, so if there's feedback, I apologize for that. We'll try to uh, work that out. And at some point, we're going to bring, be bringing it around the audience, we will ask Brandon to do that for us. But first, I just wanted to thank a few people. Uh, Bob, of course, for organizing this. I also want to give a special thanks to Daisy, uh, who has been incredibly cooperative with that. We, we live with three uh, dogs that uh, we adopted from shelters, and they're, they're wonderful dogs. Um, but I can't imagine um, them putting up with being at a conference, much less being held most of the time, uh, any of them uh, doing that. So I, I think she's the real star here. Um, also, thanks to everyone else who's involved in organizing this, bringing this out here. Uh, special thanks to uh, Gary Steiner and Gary Francione, uh, who um, are uh, the series editors of our next book. I guess it's our first book. It's, it's each of us are in other books, but we like, start our first book together, uh, which will be um, uh, forthcoming in Columbia University Press's uh, series on uh, animal ethics and so forth. At, at some point in the near future, we finished it, but we haven't gotten it back yet from the press. Uh, but we'll talk about more about that uh, tomorrow uh, in our presentation. But the book is called. The book is called uh, "Beating the Hearts: Abortion and Animal Rights." Um, as somebody right. told me, uh, you don't get enough flack just talking about animal rights, so it's important to introduce some other. Uh, Subjects. Okay, uh, Sherry's gonna, gonna get us started subsequently. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you for everybody here. Um, so, the first thing I want to say is that I, I really enjoy talking at, um, at places like this, and I, I, by that I don't mean hotels, um, but I mean places that are filled with vegans, with like minded people who believe that animals are not here for us to use. Um, I think in general that we are the minority, no matter, we, can, we might be minorities in a variety of ways, but we are certainly the minority in this respect. And there are discomforts that come of being in the minority. Um, there are assumptions that surround us in our everyday lives that I think can be, can really wear on us in ways that are not always obvious, but are, are difficult and painful nonetheless. So I'm just run one thing by you. If you're ever reading a novel, and you know, if you enjoy reading novels, and you happen to get to the part where the family celebrates Thanksgiving, what are they going to be eating? Turkey. Yes, yes, they'll be eating turkeys. Um, they might even be eating this monstrosity known as turducken, where you combine three different animals together, and it's very funny. Um, and if you're reading a book about neuroscience, or science generally, what is going to be one of the one of the questions will be, why is this species unique? And what species is that? Yes. So we'll always be hearing about that. I cannot remember. I, I like to read these sort of neuroscience books just for fun sometimes. And I cannot remember one that did not come out with this sort of, why are humans unique? Or how are humans unique? This is what makes us unique. And it almost always points to some quality that we share with other animals anyway. So it's not only hubris, it's completely unjustified hubris. And if there are children in a book, what do they need to be drinking a lot of? Yes, milk. Of course, cow's milk for their calcium. And if there happens to be an animal rights activist in the novel that we are reading, and it's rare, and I'm always excited, although I know it's come, <laughs> I'm still excited to see this, this character. And so what is this, what is this person going to be like? Crazy. Yes, crazy, crazy, violent. Yeah, I read a book by an author I generally like. I don't know if, I guess this doesn't count as defamation because it's true. Um, but I generally like this author, Chris Bajalian, but he wrote this one book where there's this vegan character who um, brings over these muffins to an, a new family that's moved into the neighborhood. And of course the muffins taste terrible because they, there can't be anything delicious in a vegan muffin, and so that was what I expected. What I didn't expect, that it would turn out that this character, and spoiler alert I guess, but this character turns out to be a witch who stays young by drinking the blood of children. 
<laughs> so I was really surprised because I really thought the blood libel was something, you know, that I, as a Jew, that I could enjoy just in that one capacity. And here I found that I could really expand my enjoyment of the blood libel to being uh, as a vegan as well. So, so that was an, as a diversification of, of the blood libel. But it was really quite shocking. So this particular animal rights activist, and she made an exception for human babies. Um, okay, so so all of these things, I think, all of these assumptions about us and about the world and about the facts and about animals can make it very lonely and difficult sometimes because we'll be in the middle of enjoying a conversation or a book or an event and suddenly someone will say that thing and you feel like going, meow, meow, <laughs> right? Um, it's like, great, they said it. And, you know, if there's, someone, if there's another vegan in the room, if you're lucky enough, you can look at that and they'll be like, yeah, I, I heard that. Um, and, uh, and that's always a good moment. So, um, so there's this unspoken foundation that I think is very much connected to the questions that people ask vegans and to what makes them tough, which is people ask vegans questions and they stand on a foundation of the normalcy of consuming animals and animal products. And that's where the questions come from. And they give the questions a power that they otherwise would not have. So that if a little child came over to us and said, you know, I need to have protein, what should I eat? We wouldn't feel some of the ways that we might otherwise feel when we confront questions because of this enormous tsunami of unwarranted and unjust assumptions that I think really ground a lot of the questions that we get. So how many of you have ever been asked tough questions about veganism by people who aren't vegan? Okay, so it's pretty, it's pretty common, right? Especially when you first decide that you want to become vegan. I know there are some of you who have become vegan recently, and I congratulate you on that. Um, and that that's that initially people start with the questions and um, when you get such questions, how do you, do you feel really fantastic, like, yay? <laughs> no, you don't, right? Even though they're, in a sense, you might expect you to feel great because you're going to get questioned and you can answer the question, but, but we don't feel great. And the reason I think that we often don't feel great is a phenomenon that Claude Steele described, Claude Steele from Stanford, as stereotype threat. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this idea of stereotype threat. You don't have to be, it's not like embarrassing not to be. I want to be quiz, though. <laughs> yes. Um, so stereotype threat is something that happens when we, some, ident some aspect of our identity becomes salient, and that aspect of our identity is a part of it that is stigmatized in some way. And when that part of our identity becomes salient, we feel threatened. And what studies have found is that we sometimes confirm the stereotype, the very stereotype that we're worried about confirming when our stereotype becomes salient. So to give an example, when women are given a very, very challenging math test at the edge of their abilities, so not something that's straightforward, but something that's at the very edge of their abilities, and they're surrounded by photographs of great men, or they're in a room where all, there are almost no women and other women in the room. They perform less well. And interestingly, when white men are in a math exam like this, and they're surrounded with images of Asian men, um, and they're the only white men in the room, they perform less well. And they did this kind of study where they would emphasize to people in the demographic questions before the test, they had women who were both Asian and women, and so the math could go either way. And half of them they asked questions like, you know, about their their living in a women's dorm or something like that that would emphasize that they were women, and half would be emphasizing their family heritage and so on. And you saw marked differences in their performance um, as a result. And this this carried over in other contexts too. And the theory of how this works is that when we are feeling like some aspect of our identity that is um, stereotyped has been made salient, 
we get very worried and anxious that we're going to confront the stereotype. And that takes cognitive resources away from the part of our brain that would be answering the question. So that we essentially don't, we have to multitask in a way that other people don't have to multitask if they're not in that situation. Um, so we have this internal conflict. Now, what are the stereotypes, are there stereotypes of vegans? <laughs> okay, so what if we know one of the stereotypes is if it's an animal rights activist and it's some kind of violent lunatic who's going to drink children's blood to stay young. I, mean, I didn't even realize that was a stereotype, but I learned that from Chris Bajalia. But, um, but what are these typical stereotypes? Dominant. Hippie. Stoner. Scrawny. Oversensitive. Emotional, oversensitive. Malnourished. Malnourished, right. Certainly protein deficient in calcium. <laughs> Elitist, right, because you have to buy the most expensive stuff to be vegan. Unless you're at a food pantry, and then why should people have to eat that stuff? Um, that tofu and beans and stuff. Okay, so there are lots of stereotypes of us. Any, uh, any having to do with our personalities? No. Melted and what? We are like weird. Weird. Overly sensitive. Angry. Are we funny and like? Do we have a great sense of humor? No. no. We're, we're we're angry. We're angry and we're humorless and we're judgmental, right? Preachy. Yeah. Aggressive. We're like. Yeah. Demanding. We're yeah. We're really basically a big pain in the ass. Um, that's the stereotype. So what happens when someone asks a question, I think, is that we're conflicted because we have a few objectives. Number one, we don't want to be conforming to that stereotype. So we're like, okay, I'm going to be non-judgmental and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm not, I'm going to be not humorless. I'll be humorful. Um, I'm, I'm not going to be militant. I'll be all relaxed. I'll be breezy. <laughs> Maybe I'll take some Valium first. Um, and I'll just be all relaxed. And, and, but also, I want to be persuasive. I want to be persuasive because this is my big chance. This is my big chance. Like, this guy could become vegan if I get if I do this right. So I'm going to not screw this up, but I'm going to be really pleased with that. <laughs> yeah, um, but I have to tell the truth. I have to tell the truth. But the truth is kind of rude. And so I don't want to be rude. So how can I be be really polite, so I'll say it's kind of, so I won't say it's violent, I'll say it's, it's kind of a little, maybe, you know, violent, <laughs> stuff like that, so, so it's trying to combine all of these different things, and that causes a lot of anxiety, and then how do you even remember what has protein? It's like, what is that list again? Greens and grains and beans, I don't know, <laughs> I'm really humorful, um, and so I think all of this happens, and it makes it very difficult to answer the questions. And then we know that this is going to happen, and so when the question comes, we, we internally feel that storm of all of this different stuff happening that's, that's um, really hard to take. So, so what do you do about it? So, um, so first thing is, I have to say, it's, it's a good idea to be informed. And so one way to be informed is, um, here's a plug for my book, Mind If I Order the Cheeseburger. So I try to answer some of the questions, 13 questions that people typically ask vegans. And, and I try to give some answers that, that one might have. Um, but I think beyond knowing the answers, because I think that that too much emphasis is sometimes placed on knowing the correct answer. Like people ask a question, they not, they're not always looking for the correct answer. They have different, um, they have different objectives, different uh, sort of agendas going on. And so I think it's really important to connect with the person asking the question and find out what's behind the question um, and and figure out what is it, what is this person up to, what do they want. Talk about your own experience. Um, and so what we're going to do a little bit of is we're going to do a little role play where I'm going to ask a question, and I want you guys to tell me what, what, are, the, what are your favorite, and then we'll, we'll, do, we'll work with those, and we'll have like alternate ways of asking and answering the question. So what are your fav what's your favorite question people ask vegans? Where do you get your food? 
Protein. Okay. So I'm going to ask you. Okay. I'm going to ask you, um, um, Norris the non-vegan. Um, My Norris, your Norris. Your Norris, and I'm going to be the. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm Norris. Okay. Who am I? <laughs> your Norris's wife. No. Um, <laughs> I'm Norris's wife. <laughs> that was what I was thinking. So I'm going to ask you the question. <laughs> Oh, wait, now we know who likes <laughs> Life of Brian. So, um, so here's the question um, of Boris the Bacon. I can be Boris, that's actually a name. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so where, do you get, where do you get your protein? Why do you ask? Well, I mean, because you need meat and, you know, to get protein, and, like, you look like you eat, but I, I don't know if you have protein. Maybe you're just hard. So am I answering this, like, intelligently, or...? Well, no, no, no you're going to answer it, answer it like you feel like answering it as a vegan sometimes. What kind of fucking idiot are you? <laughs> But you are in charge of you and not of them. And they cannot make you responsible for the choices um, that they make. So here's your chance then to share valuable information. So the person asked the question, so I'll ask again, um, where do you get uh, your protein? And remember, he asked a very important response before he, he swore at me. Um, and, and he asked why I asked, and that is really important. Because somebody, sometimes you'll find out right away, oh, I'm asking because, you know, vegans are so weird. And then you know that maybe this isn't a conversation worth having. <laughs> you know, um, like, I had a colleague who asked me a question. I'm not going to name the colleague. I, was, I, I, I know you were going to say, don't name him, her or her. Um, <laughs> well, I'm the one who swore first. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So this colleague said to me, I have a dilemma for you, Sherry. And I knew I was going to have to do with animals, of course. And so he said, this bat, it was a baby bat, flew into my house this weekend. And so I called animal control, and they said to capture the bat, bring the bat in, and so that they could kill the bat and take out the brain and see whether it had rabies in case the, rat, the, the bat would expose my daughter. So I said, well, but I'm sorry to hear that. And he said, well, I just want to know what you would have done in a situation. Because I felt kind of bad. You know, he felt kind of bad, or she. Um, <laughs> felt kind of bad. So I said, well, I think you raise a very interesting question. I said, what I would do, if you want to know what I would do, is I would just get my kids rabies vaccines and leave the bat alone because that, that way we all know we're protected and the bat gets to live. Um, but I said it's an interesting question, you know, there's a kind of a self-defense situation but not really self-defense, so it raises some of the questions that the sort of ticking time bomb scenario and terrorism hypothetical cases, this is stuff we academics talk about, um, raised, so I thought it was really interesting. And he said to me, Oh, I wasn't interested in any of that. I just wanted to know whether you cared more about your daughter or some bat. 
So sometimes that's who you're talking to, right? Somebody, you're talking to somebody who really couldn't care less, not interested. And you can say, you know what, I would someday love to answer your questions, but I feel like maybe you're not that interested. So, and I don't want to get into a, you know, a match with you. That's not useful to me or to you. So it's, it's an okay thing to decline to get into it. And I think that's really useful to remember on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about, right? Because like, you'll post something completely innocuous, and then somebody will have something to say in the comments about it. And you sort of, should I, go, should I answer them? Should I defriend them? Should I defollow them? There are all these options. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think it's useful to, um, you know, to know that you don't always have to engage. You can sometimes not engage. Um, there was, I think I posted something about Bill and Lou, the two oxen. People know the story about the two oxen in Green Mountain College and the whole, yeah, the whole fight. Sorry? We're in Vermont. Oh, okay. So you know. So you know about Bell and Lou. So I just posted something about Bell and Lou, and I thought it was really quite benign. I, I didn't think I would have. And somebody wrote, isn't it ironic? And I knew, and any, anything that begins, isn't it ironic? It's either a song about something that isn't ironic, or it's going to be provocative. So it was the latter. So the person said, isn't it ironic that if it, were, you're, if it were up to you and the world were vegan, Bill and Lou would never have existed? Oh. And I was just like, whoa, that is so ironic, man. <laughs> so, what, so what I said was, I did actually answer, although I think it was a perfectly reasonable option not to so what I said was, you know what, I would like to have a world without rape also, but I would still welcome the people who are now in the world whose parents, whose mothers were raped and they nonetheless chose to give birth to them, who are in the world, I would still welcome those children into the human community, the children of rape. I would not think it would be okay to slaughter them, for example, just because I want a world without rape. So no, I don't think it's ironic. Uh, um, anyway, but but that's you know whether that convinced him I don't I, I don't know I don't think so. Some people wrote hmm, interesting you know you get all these comments whatever and then somebody wrote hmm, I can hardly wait to have my chicken dinner. Um, so there's always something like that. So anyway, so not engaging is one option, but another option is to really connect with them. And so then now we're going to model that. Excellent. Am I still Boris? You are now Boris. Reform. So, Boris was the vegan in the last scenario. Yes, but the, but the angry thing. Oh, oh I'm, now, I'm now gentle Boris. You're, gen <laughs> you're gentle Boris. Gentle Boris coming soon. Yes, yeah, yes, right. So, okay. So, where do you get So where do you get your protein? I'm so glad you asked that because it turns out Americans get too much protein. We're practically choking on protein. You know, if you just ate the vegan elements of the foods you eat, you would be getting enough protein and all the other calories you eat because you're probably getting too many calories too. Hey! Sorry. <laughs> I guess I wasn't that gentle. Uh, I didn't mean you. I meant Americans. You mean generally. there's protein in like broccoli? Yes, broccoli is an excellent source of protein. Beans, nuts, legumes, they're all, they've all got great protein, but even green vegetables have the right amount of protein for you. Wow. Where do you think gorillas get their protein? <laughs> Not from me. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll be here all the time. Don't try to do So now one of the things that I think what you saw Boris slash Michael modeling here was as if. So sometimes, even when somebody asks you a question and you suspect that the question is meant to bait you and make you mad and, and you know, basically just let you trot out your thing, you can decide. You can decide not to engage, but you could also decide, I'm going to act as if that question were asked in good faith. I'm going to pretend slash honor the question. I'm going to say that was a really good question. And, you know, a lot of people you might say, you know, when I before I became vegan, I really didn't know that about. I thought you had to combine. This is true, actually. I, I thought you had to combine proteins. I think that book 
diet for a small planet, said stuff about combining, and people used to think that that it was really complicated. So I used to think it was really complicated to get everything you needed. And it turns out that's not true. And as, you know, and as he was explaining this to me, I felt myself getting less defensive, even though you know, I was, it was fictional. But the way he was talking to me was respectful and responded to curiosity that I may or may not have felt. So one of the ways in which you can bring somebody around to listening to you is by listening to them and by acting as if they're behaving like a bench, even if they're behaving like an asshole sometimes, right? Um, so that can be a very useful tool as well. So now shall we... Can we just wait one thing? So I, want yeah. to, I just want to add one thing to that and then we'll do our like, audience participation portion of the program. Um, so what Sherry just said, I think, is subject to being misunderstood as compromise, right? So at no point, I think, is either of us saying, you should say to someone who's asked you this, who then says, like, you know, because, I, I, you know, I've been eating, um, I've been get, eating a little less red meat lately. I, I'm mostly getting my, my protein from eggs and fish. And that's good, right? Right, so the answer to that is still gonna be, no, that's not good. I mean, th but there are ways to do, but what, so what, for us, it's, what we're saying is it's, it's all about tone. It's not about content, right? The idea is we are not saying that one should soft pedal uh, or in any way undermine the sort of straight out to radical vegan message, right? Which is, you don't need any of this stuff and it's immoral to do it. It's just a way of, you know, hating the sin, not the sinner, uh, as a way of reaching people. Okay. Yes, exactly. And I, I would, yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. And so if somebody says, you know, I'm trying to eat, I'm eating only humane animal products or such, some such crap, then, you know, then you can, you can say that, you know, I, I, you can, again, you can disengage. I'll tell you a story about disengaging. Can I tell this story? It's your microphone. <laughs> okay. Um, the reason I'm asking it. Okay. So, Michael Wait, and I... Wait, what story are you going to tell? <laughs> Michael, Michael and I were invited to an official function. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, at an at a law, official law school function. Don't say anymore about where it was. I'm not, I, yeah, I, I do have some judgment. So, um, <laughs> appearances to the contrary. So we went to this function, and we were served dinner, and there was there was a small group. So there was there were vegan options, and they were presented to us. And the person who was presenting it to us kept on seemingly to, to be hostile about it. Like I would say, oh, what's this sprinkled on here? And, and she would say, it's bread crumbs. And, and you know, it was always sort of like, yeah. And because of oh, she said because of you, there's coconut oil and the dessert instead of butter. You know, it was all this sort of stuff like because of you, life ain't half as good. So, um, so they came a point at one at one point where it turned out this woman works at a place and I said, owns, owns, owns. Oh, does she own it? I don't know. No, oh, she, I don't she, know she works there. She's a butcher. She, I, I believe she works there, and being a butcher there would mean she works there. So let's agree to okay. agree. Um, so she, um, so she says that she works at this place, and it's called the Piggery, and it's one of these local, organic. Not a pig sanctuary. No, not a pig sanctuary. Although you'd think it was a sanctuary from some of their ads. That they have they have footage of them playing with the pigs and stuff, and you know then they show the pork chops, and that's how you know it's not a sanctuary. <laughs> and um, a little clue there. So she says, "Well, those of you who have mushrooms on your plates right now are enjoying mushrooms with whatever that, that was us, and those of you who have pork chops have have chops from the piggery." where the animals have had a terrific life, a happy life, and where they're happy at slaughter. <laughs> now this, I have to say, was the first time I ever heard anyone talk about animals being slaughtered as a positive thing while serving animals. So I didn't know whether this was progress or I had entered some kind of a twilight zone. But it was <laughs> clearly sort of directed at us, happy at slaughter. And I almost said, yeah, everyone is really happy at slaughter. That's just a happy time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I didn't say that. But I was just sitting there. And then somebody at the table said, 
oh, you know, this piggery, it's such an amazing kind of thing where the animals are treated well, but then, then you get this food and it's even better. Can you tell us more about it? So this woman stands up in front of the room the way I'm standing in front of you now and begins to hold forth. And I just got up and went to the restroom and stayed there until she was done talking. And I could have said something, I could have made a sarcastic remark, and a few people said, you should have made a sarcastic remark. But I was just so, and I opened the restroom, I, I mean, it's not that I went to the restroom and vomited, I don't want you to be concerned. I just used that as a kind of safe haven. Um, and I came out in the middle and she was still talking, so I returned to the restroom and then I came back once it was all done. And the, the host afterwards, when I was leaving, the host said to me, well, thank you for handling her so graciously. And I said, well, I don't know how gracious it was. He said it was. So, so somebody noticed, somebody understood, and it was my little protest. But that was me choosing not to engage. But if you do choose to engage, absolutely, you don't soft pedal it. You don't say, that's so great that you get humane meat. I am so, I think you are just, the cat. I bet all those pigs are just like all over you with love. Um, but you can say, you know, I used to think that too, like I used to buy the grass fed. You can bring in your own experiences. We, we've all had our diluted experiences. So that's, what's so, that's what's so wonderful about this, is that we all had, well, most of us have had times when we did something we thought were really dumb and made no sense. And we can then invoke that, and that becomes a conversation piece. And we can say, yeah, you know, I used to think that too. And then I found out it wasn't so, and I felt so betrayed. So now you're on the same side as them, rather than saying, oh, you idiot, <laughs> you know, really humane. Um, so, so absolutely, I, I agree that it's a matter of tone rather than content. Um, okay, so let's, uh, so let's now do some uh, audience participation or questions that you have. So what we're asking for, to be clear, is uh, a question that you've encountered that's been awkward to answer as a vegan. And it, it, awkward it doesn't mean difficult, right? So where do you get your protein? It's not a difficult question in the sense that it's substantively diff difficult, but it's difficult because of certain social norms about how, you know, not to be rude. So I see a hand over there. I'm going to bring you the microphone. And um, since you're asking the question, you're going to get to what well, you'll see. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, I am a really big advocate of veganism, and I don't sugarcoat it. I'm like, hey, I'm vegan. It's why I've got great skin. Um, <laughs> but, and you do. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so the hardest question I get asked, and I've converted, it sounds weird saying convert, but I've converted a couple people to veganism, um, but I've had a really hard time with certain friends that say, I was vegetarian, I was even vegan for a while, and then I went back to eating meat, and I'm like, what? How? Okay? And I don't know what to say. Okay, so here's the surprise part of the program. How do you answer that? Well, I usually answer with, were you getting enough omegas, or I go in like the nutrient thing. And, and how, does that, how does that work out for you? It doesn't work. Like, <laughs> they're just like, no, I tried everything. I swear. I went to a doctor. My do I'm like, well, does your doctor promote me? Right. So, um, so this is a really hard thing, right? Because you're being confronted with somebody else's subjective experience, right? And you can't say to them, at least you can't truthfully say to them, uh, you're lying, right? You are, you are mistaken about your own subjective experience. I mean, people do sometimes, are sometimes mistaken about their own subjective experience. My mother, for 20 years, believed she was allergic to all sorts of foods. Uh, turns out she was just crazy. Um, but, uh, I mean, it wasn't like she was allergic to animal foods in particular. Anyway, it's another story entirely. Um, so, the, the, but, but, but you can't, like, what you don't want to do uh, is invalidate this person's experience, right? So one way to handle that kind of a question, I think, is to um, express sympathy, but also give them a different story, right? So, wow, that must have been so hard for you. And I'm, I'm really surprised because I know lots and lots of people, including me, who've gone vegan uh, and, you know, you know, I can say, so now I'm actually talking to you in a second, my own voice, right? Uh, there was a kind of breakthrough period.
period, right? So for the first six months, I still thought, I well, I missed cheese or something like that. And then it's when I just knew what I was doing and it got to be easy. Um, I'm really curious why your experience would be different because human beings are all the same species. It's not as though, I mean, right, there are sort of like weird views out there that say that, well, some people need more this or yin or yang or this or the other thing, right? But that's it's pseudoscience, right? We all have basically the same uh, uh, biological requirements. Uh, there are some people who may have sensitivities to certain things, right? But so, you know, basically uh, to, to try to point out that this seems odd without validating your experience. Yeah, I think, I think that that's, that's really good. I mean, I think it's great that you were trying to help them figure out what went wrong because that's premised on the idea that they wanted to be vegan, which they said, and they were having a hard time doing that. And so you were asking them about the various things that they might, and that their answer could have been, oh yeah, I didn't get that, I didn't, you know, I wasn't getting my omegas, or I wasn't getting, I wasn't eating enough beans, or I wasn't eating enough food, which, you know, which is often the case. Um, sometimes it's useful to find out whether they just decided they don't want to do this anymore. Because, of course, that's often, unfortunately, what happens. And so you can say, wow, that, what, what, what decided it for you? And sometimes they'll say, well, you know, my boyfriend, da 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 And then that might be the reason. And, I, and you can say, well, that must be hard when you're in a couple, and one of you is vegan, and the other one is vegan, and it is not vegan, and, you know, so that must be tough. And, you know, give them a chance to talk about it. And who knows, they may end up surfacing some issue that, that, that you couldn't possibly have anticipated. But, but, it's, but what's tough is I think the experience, and you may experience it this way, is, is oh no, I have to get them back. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like that's the feeling like, okay, so they've strayed and they've come to me and here's my, here's my big chance. Um, I had a student in my animal rights, I teach an animal rights class and I had a student and we were going around the room with people talking about why they're taking the course. And he raises his hand and he says, this is my last semester here, here's your chance. Oh. And, so, and, and I felt like, oh no, my chance. Um, I don't want a chance. <laughs> so, so, but I think that that's, um, that sometimes that can blind us a little bit if we're thinking like, now it's my big chance. Fo keep the focus on them. Like they're saying this, so, so how did that happen? So why did that happen? And while that must have been tough, and they might say, yeah, it really was tough because I really cared about animals, and I still do. And, you know, that doesn't mean they're going to now say, I guess I'll be vegan. You know, it's not like a cartoon where it ends with the perfect end. But, but maybe they think about it some more. And, and, you know, maybe they do say, you know, well, I was feeling, I was feeling kind of, you know, whatever symptoms of not having enough omega. I was, I, my, my thinking was getting foggy. And you might say, you know, maybe you weren't getting your omegas. Did you have walnuts or whatever? Or well, maybe you weren't so smart to begin with. Right. That's, that's always a winner. That's, people love to hear that. <laughs> So, but, but sometimes it has to do with kind of trying to shift the focus from yourself because I think we can feel so much put on the spot that we forget that they've just told us something. Maybe they're seeking absolution, which we're not going to give. You know, we know that in advance. People will say, well, you know, I do eat some meat. I had a lot of meat last week. Do people do this too? They tell you about all the, oh, you're vegan. So I had, oh, I had a lot over the holidays. And it's like, well, why are you telling me this? <laughs> Um, but they do that. Um, so you're not going to give them a solution, but maybe they actually don't feel good about it, and, and, and they figure you're somebody who might support their not feeling good about it. So you know, maybe just give them that space, and that could help. Maybe. By the way, I, I, one thing that's worth asking in these situations is, you know, why did you become vegan in the first place, right? So sometimes, you know, this, this is something that I can come that we see a lot with celebrities who are vegan for a while, and then they aren't. Um, and, uh, well, so there's a certain, right, some people do things because it's a fad. They may have been doing it because they thought it was a good way to lose weight and they lost the weight and now they've heard that the paleo diet is a good way to lose the weight, right? So, um, you know, if they say something like that, right, you can argue with them, but I think the more promising case is the person who said, well, I was, you know, I, I read Introduction to Animal Rights and I was really persuaded uh, that, I, that it was immoral to do these other, right? 
they're probably not going to say that even if it was true, right? Because once they say that, then it's like, really? So you felt a little lightheaded occasionally, and that justifies murder? Um, so, you know, so, because that doesn't make any sense. So, and because what they might need then is to, to remember why they were doing it in the first place, and they'll sort of work a little bit harder. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes, um, so uh, we're going to send the mic. Brandon is going to bring the microphone back to the gentleman back there and then to this. Oh, how about to this young lady? Isn't she right there? I just want to add to uh, what she said because. Wait, why, why don't we find out her name? That's right. Misty. Hi, everyone. I'm Mohini. And um, just to add to it because people. Um, I had a, I have a friend. Who's a, he? He was vegetarian, and then he said he had to eat meat again because of his blood type. And he said that that's what the doctor said. He was type M, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't really know what to say because it's what the doctor ordered. So I just said that for me, it's about my love for animals. And um, he said that he he wasn't feeling good, and he had to for some reason that like, he had to function and the only way for him to function would be to eat meat, so... Yeah. <laughs> Blood type. <laughs> yeah. So, um, again, right, it's a question of feeling out where the conversation is going, whether you can get away with this, but one of the questions is, really, was, is this a doctor who's trained in nutrition? Because, the, you know, one of the things you're trained as a lawyer is, uh, on, on cross if you're cross-examining a witness, uh, you should never ask a question either that you don't know the answer to or the sort of stricter version of that is to which the answer can hurt your case, right? So here's a question that, can, that you can't hurt your case because you know the answer. Is the doctor trained in nutrition? The answer is almost certainly no, unless the doctor also went to nutrition school in addition to medical school, right? So doctors just say these things because, you know, I'm a doctor, I should know about human health, I eat meat, therefore eating meat must be necessary, right? It's not based on any studies or anything like that. So, you know, but but people, you know, trust in their doctors, and so it's hard because, right, like, I don't know, I'm not trained in nutrition either, except that I know more about nutrition than doctors because, you know, I've read about it. Uh, so you do, I think that is a problem. People, people will invoke authority. So can I add, uh, as a nurse, the doctors who are pushing the blood type diets are usually naturopaths. They're not... Medical MDs. So, okay, the MDs know nothing about the blood type diet. Is there any science behind the blood yeah, type? Science. No, yes. Thank you. All right, uh, Brandon, can you bring the microphone to the gentleman in the back there, the vegan shirt? <laughs> I assume everybody's shirts are vegan in the sense that they're not wearing wool or anything, but it says. Or, or a meat dress. <laughs> My name is Philip Wadden. A recent question. Philip, can you tell us why you're spending so much money on animal projects when there are children dying of cancer? <laughs> you must hate children. So, so what do you say? I speak very politely and gently and offer my sympathy by saying it's a terrible thing when cousins marry. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I don't uh, often say that too rudely. What I do say is um, uh, vegans, you will find, are very generous to all causes, not just animal causes. You'll find that vegans donate money to Amnesty International, Greenpeace, and other organizations don't have much to do with animals at all. But if you really want to take care of children suffering with cancer, get them and their parents and their friends and family off the meat and dairy drug. That's the most powerful force factor you could ever start. Yeah, but so... Uh, so one of the things we've been doing with our kids um, is since they were little when we could get away with it is, um, you, you know, since uh, those of you who have kids or know people with kids, they just accumulate crap. Uh, that, and it's not good for them, it's not good for anybody. Uh, so when they have a birthday, we 
sort of would say, how about if we tell people instead of a gift to make a donation? And usually they're amenable to that. Uh, and we like, to, and, you know, for their, for their vegan friends, we, you know, recommend a donation to um, a, an animal sanctuary or a local shelter or something like that. But what we tend to want to try to do for their non-vegan friends is we recommend donations to uh, organizations that provide vegan food to uh, uh, children around the world who are hungry uh, on the theory that, you know, for, for two reasons. One, because, for many reasons. One of which is, it's good for the children. It's, another is, it's good for the animals who are not being used to uh, feed these children. But a third is, then they have to go to the website of the organization, which is going to uh, explain to them how helping animals is also in the interests of people, especially people who are in the greatest need of help. And one of the things I'd add to that, um, Philip, is that I think it's interesting that people even pose that challenge to you because it's so disrespectful. Um, if, if somebody, if you were to say, if I were to say, for example, I work to for the rights of women. I try to make sure that you know women are safe in their relationships. It's hard to imagine that someone would say, oh yeah, and what about all of the children in other countries, or what about the women in other, you know, nobody would throw that in my face as, as, as a response to, to saying that. And so the suggestion is, in a way, not only that it takes a lower, animals should take a lower priority, but that they really should take no priority at all. And so I think it's I think it's great that you're able, in the face of what I think is a very disrespectful and dismissive kind of question, to really give them an, an excellent substantive answer. And what is so great about the answer is that it's true that you're that you're helping you're helping children indirectly even by pressing veganism because it is so harmful to issues including world hunger to be utilizing our planet to create animal food. So it's in a way that veganism is so rich with possibility and with what it does for our planet, for the animals, and for our health, that it, it, it really helps us a lot answer the questions itself. Can I, can I have one more thing? So you were in finance before you became an animal rights person, right? Correct. Yeah, so how, how often did you get that question when you were, when you were doing banking? Like, what are you doing wasting your time in banking when you could be aiding lots of children? Now, not at all. Right, so so it's, it's it's very interesting, right? The idea is, right, it, if you're just sort of, you know, living a completely selfish life, then you get a free pass. But if you're doing something for animals, well, then you're just a nut uh, or, uh, or, or affirmatively evil. So there's a, there's a, there's a oddity there. That's true. It's true. When I said I was, when people would ask me what I do and I'd say I'm going to law school, they, they wouldn't say, you know, like, oh my God, you know, what, what about all the suffering in the world? Well, Even though... Thinking, <laughs> they might have been, but they didn't say it. So, so there is this sense of wow, like this is helping animals really falls beneath just about any, you know, made off is higher up on, on the, you know, the scales than uh, that. Uh, okay, so other other questions. Okay, so uh, you want to bring the microphone over there. Kaylee, um, I have a six-year-old daughter, and we eat vegan at my house. Um, occasionally, people who don't always respect my decisions might feed her cheese, but she eats no meat. And oftentimes, I get questions like, "How dare you brainwash your child?" or oh, "She's not going to grow up to be healthy." And so, I really struggle with not being defensive in that. First off, who are you to criticize my parenting skills? Because um, I feel that's a skill. But second off, I think it comes from the misconception that children can't think independently. That if I provide information to my child about where animals come from and they have feelings and families, that she is reasonable enough to make a decision about whether she wants to eat them or not. And so it's really hard for me to find a kind and compassionate answer that's not defensive in regards to having a child who's vegan. It's, it's a really tough question, I think, because it is true that it's incredibly rude. And I think there are two pieces to the question, right? So the first is, you're brainwashing your child. So first of all, that's an incredibly obnoxious thing to say. 
right? Can you imagine, like, let's say there's somebody on a bus telling their child, you know, the world was built in six days. And then you came over and you said, excuse me, um, I have a little intervention I'd like to make here. Um, there's actually a longer period of time here involved. Um, you would be considered an outrageous um, interloper and you would be told to return to your seat at, at, at best case scenario. So, um, so it's really rude, and I think I think you're right to feel like you know what? How how dare you in a way as as your response? So that's the first part about brainwashing. Another feature of the brainwashing question is that's what parenting is. Um, I mean, parenting is. I don't mean to say. Um, what what is that? does that sign say? We don't have much time. Because there are five minutes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's what I'm there saying. Um, so. Brainwashing is teaching values that are yours to your children. That's one of the things we do with our children. We don't say to our children, okay, there are these various options. There's one, there one approach which says that you can kill people and run them over if you're if in your car if you're really late for meeting. And then there's this other approach that says nonviolence. And we'd like you to pick which one. And today, for today, we're going to be running people over just to get the experience. <laughs> Be dodging people and stopping at stop signs, and so we don't do we, we don't give people the whole children the whole. And in fact, they'll accuse you of confusing them. If you should happen to be in a relationship with somebody and the two of you are different religions or something like that, and this, aren't you confusing the children by not brainwashing them in the one way? So I think the brainwashing question is unfair and it's very rude. Um, and the other piece of it is that they think that you, that the idea that, that you're, the choices you're making are not good for your children. And I think that you can reassure them because there is so much paranoia. I mean, there's just a sense that, oh, you know, that it's dangerous, that veganism could be dangerous. Like, I think you can say, you know, we work, we, we, we have a pediatrician and a nutritionist that we talk to, and we're very confident in all of the food choices that we make. Just so that just so that they don't call anybody with some kind of weird complaint. I mean, I think that that's a key thing. You want to protect the security of your and safety of your home by assuring the person that you know what you're doing. But as far as brainwashing in terms of values, you can say I'm teaching my child values the same way that everybody teaches them. My, the values I teach are nonviolent, and my child finds them very appealing. And I don't have, I never have to break it to them that what the chicken is actually a chicken. And they, they turn out to be, you know, I mean, we are far from ideal parents, but I think this is the one way, or I am, um, one, well, one way in which I think we, you know, we take a lot of pride is that our kids who are 13 and going on 11 um, have been vegan, you know, since we became vegan, which was what, eight, nine, eight, eight nine years ago, um, and they, you know, they own it, uh, and I mean, even beginning at six, they, they did, and you know we we used to worry like I mean we you know they still haven't hit those even more rebellious years, so it's possible that they'll do something. But but we used to worry well like we, we would go to these programs. People talk about giving their kids their food choices, and you know how it's important to give your kids their food choices. And we would then talk about it like privately. It was like we're not giving them any choices. We're not giving them a choice to be racist or sexist or homophobic. We're not giving them a choice to be speciesist either. It's true that in all of those circumstances, with respect to all of those, right, if they end up doing that within the limits of the law, once they're adults and on their own, we can't stop them. But that doesn't mean we're going to, you know, condone it or even allow it while, you know, they're, they're minors. Uh, so there's, um, you know, there's the opportunity there, you know, the, I guess the hard thing about that question, right, it's not, hard, like all these questions, not a hard question. It's a hard question to answer truthfully while being civil. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it's useful to be civil, but it's also useful to tell the truth. Last question. You don't need mic. Just shout it out. Um, well, you might have to ask. I don't know if I'm in the format, but I just my sister actually did exactly that to me, and she said, "I love animals while she's eating the pork." I love animals, and so she's giving me the option that we've been talking about. She hasn't even asked me a question. <laughs> she is not asking me the question that I'm dying for her to ask me. How do you deal with a family member, a loved one, with whom you have such a, a lifetime history? How 
Uh, well, so we're not experts on this. I mean, we have the same struggle as everyone else does. Uh, a lot of it depends on the nature of your relationship with that sibling or parent or cousin or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, one thing that a, a vegan friend of ours said when we were describing the difficult situation we had, exact, exactly like this, um, which we've had with some relatives and not with others, was he said, you know, it sounds like the issue there is not that you're vegan and she's not, but your relationship, right? So that if you have the kind of relationship where you can say, you know, I love animals too, and that's why I'm vegan, then you can say that. If you can't, it's not because you're vegan and she's not. All right, I think we're out of time. So thank you all very much. Sherry Powell and Michael Thor for a wonderful presentation at the World Vegan Summit and Expo and they will